Narayanam Namaskritam, Naram Chavan Rotamam, Devim Sarasantim Yasam Dito Jay Rira, Nashto Priyashu, Bhadresu, Nityam Bhagata Savia, Bhagati Atamashuki, Bhakti Bhavati Naistiki, Nigamakaparu Vikaritam Param, Shukamakara Mita, Jovisamitam, Kebata Bhagatam Rajam, Bahora or Sikabuvi Bakaham, Vishna Sadamukhagate, Damigin, Yixer, Karuna Sadi Samisha Paranako to Nodi Tam. Amapiasa Adabashuta Vishutam Vibu Samapia and Abidam the Rukhsaram Prakahi to Hulma or Tatanam Sankhaisan of Animusani Nanyatam. Yogre Pati Meandasha Skalapate Gatam who shark Hita Yasana Nida Shantu Santo Vidam Vidam. Mokam Kavit Bakarian Sabarish Marani Panga Yanga and then the day Katarigani. Guru Brahma Guru Vishnu, Guru Dev Maheshara, Guru Shaksha Para Brahma, Tajmai Shri Guru Vedam. He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dino Vanu Jagatate, Gopisha Gopika Kantara the Kansamo Tate Jayatam Surito Pango, Mam Vinter Mater Gati, Matsavisha Param Boja Rada Ramadan Mohanam Sriman Rasa Rasa Rambi, Vamsivada, Karsan Sunir Ganopati, Gopinata Sri Saram Divya Vrindaranya Kapa Drumada, Shima Ratna Gadashima Sanisto, Sri Sri Rada Shida Govinda, Presta Babi, Seva Manushmanami Namo Brahmani Devaya Go Brahmani Taya Chajikari Taya Krishnaya Go Vinaya Namo Namaha Om Vagana Timananda Shagana Gana Sadaka Chaksuru Niditam Yana Taj Mahi Shri Gadeva Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Vishnam Savitam Yana Bhutare Sayam Rupa Karam Yam Tarati Swapadantikam Vandeham Sri Guru Siyata Parakamaram Sri Guru Vaishnavam Sha Sri Rupam Sagaritam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Stam Sajayavam Sadvaitam Savadutam Paritana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Siddhartha Krishna Padan Sahagana Ladita Shri Vishakan Vitam Sahagana Namah Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pasaya Bhutare Shimari Bhakti Padanta Swami Tanamana Manishti Sari Sati Devi Gauravani Pacharine Nir Vishesh Sanyori Paskata De Satarine Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sarigo Bhakta Bindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Hari Rama, Hari Rama, 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 Hari Hari. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. A word from you, my man. Good morning, Prabhuji. Uh, just enjoying the struggles and challenges of uh, and joys of learning how to care for my son's needs. Is he with you today? He is. Oh, wonderful. How do you bow, Cal? How do you bow, Cal? He ran into the other room. <laughs> okay. How was your Christmas? Oh, here he is. It was it was it was good and challenging just teaching him to deal with so much excitement. <laughs> uh, we had our services. Christmas came on Saturday. So we we uh, honored our normal Saturday evening service on Christmas Day in Salt Lake City. Good crowd. Not quite as big as normal, but nevertheless uh you know, 25, 30 people. We had a visitor from Bhakti Center, also a Satyananda Swami disciple, was visiting his sister, um, uh, Banu, in the area. I forget his initiated name. But that was nice having him drop in. <clears throat> very, very nice uh, Saturday night program. I went up myself, gave the talk, uh, led the initial kirtan, and Subi, Subi Raghava happened to drop in, so um, she led the the evening RT, which is very nice. We had a, a snowstorm on Sunday in Spanish Fork, and um, in spite of the fact that unless you had a four-wheel drive, you couldn't get up our hill, we still had a good crowd. Some people who didn't have the four-wheel drive and couldn't get up the hill, parked at the bottom of the hill and walked up. But it was good, a very, very good, highly surcharged spiritual weekend, and I hope, I hope the same was had for all of you. I know Brent, because he was here yesterday with us celebrating. Govinda Dave has a huge family. It's one of those LDS patriarchs. So I'm sure holiday weekends where the family gets together, big, big occasions for him. Good morning, Govinda Dave. Jean, Hari Hari Bo, hope you had a good holiday weekend. Sundari Priya, Thomas, we're looking forward to Thomas stopping by on New Year's Eve, spending the night and helping us with the Japathon. Um, just as Christmas was on Saturday, seven days later, we have New Year's holiday on a Saturday. And as you know, we all celebrate that by chanting as many names of God on our beats as we possibly can. 
normally, as I recall, we reach four or five million names of God in that particular day, which is a great way to start off the new year. Everybody's welcome to participate, keep track of your rounds and report in. Thomas says he can't wait. Mm. Mahatma, we're all seeing all kinds of sumptuous mouth-watering posts on her Facebook page, Prashadarians, many of them coming from the newly emerged <clears throat> Las Vegas restaurant. Las Vegas opened a few years ago, and the restaurant's been open uh, except during COVID. But with new management now, it is uh, spectacular. I can't wait till we go down there in April to do the Festival of Colors and hang out there for a week and eat at the buffet. By Bobby's dropping in, she's dressing the deities up in the temple and listening at the same time. <clears throat> so let's uh, proceed now with our third segment on this same verse in the first canto of the Shuman Bhagavatam, as always. Narada Muni is the speaker, and he says, Amayo Yashabhutanam Jayati Panati Chikitsaram. He says, O oh, good soul, does not a thing apply therapeutically cure a disease which was caused by that very same thing? And the reference here is you can often get indigestion by overindulgence in milk products. Um, and yet the cure for that indigestion is taking milk in another form, in the form of a yogurt. When you take milk in the form of yogurt, not only does it not give you indigestion, but it may cure indigestion which from which you're suffering because of overindulgence in milk products. So work outside of God consciousness, self-centered work as opposed to God-centered work, is minding, evocative of misery. Whereas you take that same work, <clears throat> raising a family, pursuing a career, making income, paying the bills, interacting with your fellow workers, your fellow family members, um, your fellow recreationists in the gym, wherever, in a God-centered way, has the opposite result of freeing you, liberating you from all material entanglements and material miseries. And the reason is, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, 10th verse, 7th chapter, Bija Mam Sarvavalutanam, Bidi Parta Panatana. We're going to talk about God as the sea from which everything comes, and the ramifications, and the conclusions that we reach from that. Krishna says, O son of Prita, know that I am the original seed of all existences, Sarv Kav Idam Brahma. Actually, you have in the seed of a banyan tree, the whole blueprint for the banyan tree. When the banyan tree fully manifests itself, Prabhupada said there's a banyan tree in the Calcutta Botanical Garden, which is over 500 years old. And it occupies like several acres. The, what happens is as the branches go down, they, the branches, some of the branches go vertical and they support the horizontal growth of the tree. So the banyan tree covers a great deal of square footage. So there's one that's over 500 years old in Calcutta, but that originally began with a small seed. And inside of that small seed 500 years ago, the entire blueprint of the mature banyan tree was already contained. So that means that as in as so much as Krishna claims, Bijamam Sarvabhutanam, I am the seed from which everything came, the blueprint for the entire created spiritual and material worlds was there originally in God. And therefore, there can be nothing in the created world, there can be nothing in the banded tree which was not contained, at least in codified form, in the tiny minuscule sea. So there's nothing in this material world which is not have Krishna as its source. Krishna is, at the same time, the maintainer. He enters into the material world as the Paramatma, to maintain it during his period of manifestation. And in fact, uh, he is, the material world, Sav Kalvidamarva, is nothing more than that seed expanded, that seed working itself out according to the codified original set of blueprints. So this all indicates that there is only one God and that in fact there is nothing else but him. The whole idea of a Satan, of a personality who can carve out an area of sovereignty and compete with God is unfounded in the Vedic literature. It makes no sense. Darkness can never compete with the sun. 
Whenever the sun is present, darkness is absent. In fact, darkness is defined as the absence of the sunlight. Now, everything originates from the seed, which is Krishna. That seed becomes everything. Krishna enters into everything as the air enters into the cloud to keep it aloof. And when it's time for annihilation, everything again goes back into the seed-like form. Therefore, there is no room in God's creation for any competitor or for anyone else to carve out an area of sovereignty. Nitya nityanam chaitanas chaitanam ekil vedanti kama. We, every living being, from the ant to Lord Brahm himself, every moment of your waking and sleeping day, all of us, and there are quite a few, 8,400,000 species, uh, it's, it's incalculable how many members of each species there are, what the total number of living entities is. There's no calculator in the world that can figure that out. <clears throat> but just in terms of categories of forms and just in terms of bodily shapes, there are 8,400,000. So there are a lot of us created beings, from Brahma down to the end. And yet it is said that all the many, the plural living beings, are maintained by the one singular, eternal, all-powerful living being. Our maintenance, our sustenance, our existence rests upon him. The existence, the maintenance, the sustenance of the many rests upon the one. Nitya is singular, nityanam is plural. We are dependent for air, for water, for foodstuffs, for shelter. All of us are dependent on the one supreme living being. <clears throat> Chaitanas, Chaitana. And we ourselves have consciousness. We're created from God. God is a conscious living being. So as his parts and parcels, we also possess consciousness. But our consciousness is limited. Each one of the uncountable living beings which inhabit this material world has a, has, has a field, which is this body. And they have some level of awareness of our consciousness of this body. For instance, we know we have hairs on our head. We know that when we eat food, the food digests and we get energy. How many hairs we have on the head, exactly how the food is digested, we don't know. But we know a few things, and our knowledge is limited. But that chaitanas, that singular, eternal, living being, has entered into each and every atom, has entered into the heart of all living beings, and it is said, He knows everything. There's no, everything is known to him, and nothing remains unknown. He's the cause of all causes. He knows everything. From him, everything comes. There can be nothing in the created, manifested cosmos which was not originally in him, contained with him in seed-like form. Therefore, Eko Bahunam Yovidadatikam. That one living being provides for all the necessities of life of the pure, thorough living beings. There is no second to him. There is only one than whom nobody can be greater or equal. He's one. We're not talking about the oneness of the Maya bodies of the impersonalists, which mix up God and the living beings. We're talking about him being one spiritual essence, separate and apart and remote from this created material world. Just like a fire can be situated in one place, and yet the fire is also some distance away in the form of its energies. And the energies may take different forms. The energies may, we may experience those energies in a variety of ways. We experience smoke. We cough because of the smoke. We watch out when the sparks shoot out from the fire. We make sure they don't land on the rug or land on our uh, cloth. Um, and we also warm ourselves from the flames, from the heat. So the smoke, the sparks, the flames, these are all non-different from the fire. But at the same time, the fire itself would burn us up. If we were in proximity of the fire, we would be immolated. And so 
The fire manifests itself. The energies of the fire take the form of smoke, sparks, and flames, and warmth, and light, and heat. But the fire itself has none of those varieties. The fire is one. Example is given. Earth is one. Earth is pretty much one. Now in that earth you sow seeds. And from those seeds and the way they interact with the earth and draw their nourishment from the earth, various trees, fruits, and vegetables sprout up. And there's a variety of tastes, which are the result. Nobody eats dirt, right? You don't sit down to a breakfast, lunch, and dinner of dirt. And yet from the dirt, which is one, you get, for instance, sugar cane. You plant the sugar cane seed, and the sugar cane grows. In India, they have these big, they're like uh, ringers, big ringers. You turn the handle, and there's a couple of uh, rollers. And you push the sugar cane in there, and, you, and it crushes the sugar cane and squeezes the juice out. And you can buy this, the most refreshing, healthy, nourishing, and cheapest. India, things are less expensive than America. But of all the various types of fresh fruit drinks that you can get, the cheapest, the most bang for your buck is sugar cane. And it's sweet. It's it completely, usually sweet is not healthy. Normally, the sweeter it is, the less healthy it is. But the exception is sugar cane. It's, it, is, it is the sweetest, and yet it is completely healthy. Uh, so it satisfies our desire for sweetness, and yet it comes from earth. No, no one's going to take a drink of earth, and, and that, that will not satisfy one's sweetness. Earth never in itself itself satisfied sweetness, but within the earth is the capacity to satisfy sweetness. Now, another plant which will grow from the earth are oranges and lemons. So oranges and lemons are a variety which are produced in order to satisfy our taste for a mixture of sweet and sour. There are pineapples, there are apples, there are oranges, there are kiwi fruits, there are pomegranates, and there are chilies, and these all come from earth. And yet from that one substance, earth, there are so many varieties produced. Although the earth or the ground is the same, there are different tastes which arise due to different kinds of seeds. So Krishna says, Bija mam sarva bhutanam. I am the original seed of all existences. So the Lord is one. All those say, tastes and varieties exist inside the Lord in their dormant or nascent form. So everything is contained within the Lord. When you chant the names of the Lord, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hari Ram, Hari Ram, Ram Ram, Hari Hari. You connect, you hook up with the Lord through sound vibration. The Lord is personally dancing on the tip of the tongue of anybody who is diligently and attentively chanting his holy name. Now, the, the nature of the absolute truth is that he's non different from his name. In the relative world, the name of something and the substance are different. You can't satisfy your thirst by chanting water, water, water. But on the absolute platform, any bona fide name of the Lord and the Lord are non-different. You personally associate with the Lord by chanting his holy names. He said, Nama Chintamani Krishna Chaitanya Purna Sutta Nitra Bina Bam Nami Namino. The name of Krishna has a transformative effect. It can take the dull, ignorant, self-centered living being and it can transform the very heart, the very core of that living being, just like butter is melted by fire, can transform a selfish, ignorant person into a gentlemanly, sensitive, considerate devotee of the Lord. That is the transformative, powerful effect of the simple practice of invoking the Lord by chanting his holy name. And it is further said, Purna, Siddha, Nitya, Mukta, this sound vibration, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, 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 has nothing to do with the material world. Having produced orange trees and lemon trees and pineapple trees, 
the earth still remains separate and distinct and remote from those produced items. So similarly, the Lord remains separate and remote from this material world. The name of the Lord is not describing any temporary fleeting coming and going, appearing and disappearing phenomenon in this material world. The name of the Lord, just like the Lord himself, is Nitya, Mokta. It is eternally separated. It is remote from this changing material world. And it is also porn. It's full. There are many instances of saints and sages throughout history. Yudhishthira once while traveling through the jungle, as described in the seventh canto of the Bhagavatam, he met this sage. And this sage was, had taken a vow. It's called the vow of the python. He vowed to only chant the names of the Lord and not lift a finger for his own personal names. He said, God is the provider of all living beings. His name is full. So if I simply occupy and dedicate myself to chanting the names of the Lord, I should not have to lift a finger in order to maintain ourselves. We say that, you know, take care of God and then everything else will take care of itself. Do the main thing. Every other smaller thing will fall into place. But here, this sage put it to the test. He said, name of God is full, pour him. Everything is contained, so whatever I need for my maintenance, I'm going to have the faith that it will be provided to me if I simply honor the Lord by chanting holy. So the Yudhisthira was having this philosophical conversation with this saint. And he, in the course of the conversation, he said, I don't do anything to gather or produce or plant or harvest or, harvest or cultivate food. I just live by the bow of the python. What the python does is, he simply stays in one place with his mouth open. He has good um, skills of camouflage, granted, but he doesn't go here and there. He doesn't track his prey. He doesn't travel anywhere. He remains stationary with his mouth open. And if someone something walks into his mouth, he eats. If something doesn't walk into his mouth, he doesn't eat. So this sage said, Dharma Dharma Pide Ani Hani Mahari Mahari means big, big snake. So he took the vow of the big, big snake. So Yudhisthira says the most interesting thing here, which shows us that it actually works. If you attentively and submissively and purely chant the name of the Lord, not only you'll have your needs fulfilled, but you'll get more than you could ever imagine or want. So Yudhisthira says, he says, if you're if you're just lying there on the path, taking what only food comes to your mouth, how come you're so fat? <laughs> he says, you don't look like you're suffering at all. I said, I said, yes, Lord is providing me more than I need. He's providing more calories than I burn every day. When you get more calories than you burn, then you put on weight in this stage. It was a little overweight, you know, his doctor would tell him to cut down a little bit. <laughs> the fact is that the seed then becomes manifest as a tree. And as a tree, whether it be an orange tree or a lemon tree or an apple tree or a kiwi fruit tree or a pomegranate tree, there will appear varieties of fruit with different types of tastes from the trunk, branches, leaves, flowers, and finally, fruits of that tree. Now, this is the philosophy of a chinta beta beta tattva. But just as the seed is separate from the tree, which is separate from the trunk, which is separate from the branches, which is separate from the leaf, which is separate from the flowers and separate from the fruits, similarly, God, who is bijamam sarvabhutam, the seed of everything, is at the same time non-different from the trunk, branches, leaves, flowers, and fruits, and at the same time, separate from all of that. This is called a chinta beta beta God. God is at one and the same time non-different from and separate from his created living beings. Bhakti Vinod Thakur has sung, Kesheva Tuya Jagata Vichitra. My Lord, your creation is full of varieties. Lord Brahma, the 
um, engineer of the creation describes in the ninth chapter of the seventh canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Tat sambhava kapira tod nyada bhashanam tom bija matma tatam sabahira chantya nabinda dabda satam akshinam ajano jatayankare katam upalabita bijam. As you know, Brahma appeared not from the womb of any mother, but he manifested from the whirl of a lotus flower. Around him, everything was darkness. So first he assumed that his source, uh, his meaning, was to be discovered by external exploration. He thought if he went out far enough or climbed down the stem of the lotus flower far enough, he would discover the very source of his existence and then be able to um, uncover what it was that he was created from. So he did that. He dove into the water, he swam around, he penetrated outer space, he climbed down the stem of the lotus flower. For 100 years, by the calculation of the demigods, he did empirical research and came up with zip, nada, nothing. No trace of the Lord was to be found. And the example that's given here is very interesting. It says that once the seed fructifies and grows, the original seed cannot be found. And that was the experience of Brahma. That there was this whole phenomenal world divided into darkness, loaded flower, outer space, there was water. All the elements were there, earth, air, fire, and water. And once Brahma became instructed, enlightened, and empowered by the Lord, he was able to create infinitely more varieties, taking those basic energies of earth, air, fire, and water, taking those five energies and interacting with the three modes of material nature, sattva, rajas, and tama, he's able to create 8,400,000 species of life, all kinds of varieties of living being, populating the whole universe. Every square inch of the universe is teeming with variegated life forms. The Lord Brahm was able to do that. But it was not through external empirical research that he was able to discover the source of his creation. Just as much as when a seed fructifies, becomes a, a trunk, branches, leaves, flowers, fruits, and, and so on and so forth, the original seed is no longer to be found. Another example that Prabhupada gives in the purport to this verse in the seventh canto is that you take cotton. Cotton is one. But you can transform cotton into thread. The thread is woven into cloth. The cloth may be made a coverlet. It may be made to make a quilt. It may be made to make a shawl. It might be woven into pants. It might be woven into a top piece. But once that's done, you can no longer discern the original thread. What to speak of the original cotton. That original fluffy cotton is no longer visible. Just as an aside, I spent a year working in a kibbutz in Israel. Most of the time, I worked with the sheep. We'd milk them early in the morning. And one time, once a year, we'd cut their wool for, for cotton, um, for wool. But um, sometimes during harvest seasons, we would be put on other deployments. For instance, when the avocados were ripe, Everyone would leave their normal routine departments and go pick av avocados. Or when the apples were ripe, we'd all have to harvest apples. Well, there was one couple of weeks there period when the cotton cotton needed to be um, plucked. So they had a machine. You know, you have the teeth. The machine goes along, and it strips the cotton, the fluffy balls of cotton, from the plants. And then it, it brings it into, that, into this huge uh, bin. Now, cotton has very little weight and very little density. And so this big um, bin on wheels moving along uh, fills up very quickly. It fills up very quickly. There's a, there's a grid on top and a little lid, a little like hatch. But the cotton fills up very quickly. Um, however, that container has the capacity to hold a lot of cotton. Therefore, you need some weight. You need someone to push down the cotton so that more and more cotton can be contained within this container as it's harvested. And so our job, a couple of our, in Israel, the Hebrew word for volunteers, miknut, miknut beam, miknut beam. So there were two or three of us. We would open the hatch. And, I mean, this wasn't the hardest job in the world, I'll grant you. This was a cushy, literally a cushy job. So we, 
we would just lie on top of the cotton. Can you imagine, right? We would lie on top of the cotton so that as, as the cotton was came in, it was compressed, it was made more dense, and so you could get 10 or 20 times more cotton in that container than it than than not having us with our weight pushing it down. And then we would go and load it and go back and more. And so one of the most idyllic, iconic memories of I have of my year in Israel was one evening, the sun was just setting on the horizon. We were coming in, we were going out for the last load of cotton and we got it. And then we were, we were lying just with our, you know, our heads just a couple of inches from the, from the top grill. The sun was going down, we were going in at the end of a hard day's work in the Holy Land, if you will. Um, so originally from cotton, which is one, the cotton is transformed into thread, just like the other example, the seed is transformed into the trunk of a tree. And then the thread is woven, it's dyed and woven, it's made into cloth. And then the original cotton is no longer discernible. It's no longer identifiable. Similarly, it's perfectly correct that when the seed that had generated from the navel of Garbhodai Vishnu became manifested as the cosmic creation, one could no longer understand what the cause of that cosmic creation was. And yet, I'm sure you'll grant us the fact that without that original seed, nothing would exist. And within that original seed were all the elements, was the entire blueprint of the cosmic manifestation. Therefore, it is said, my Lord Brahma himself, the creator, in the Brahma Samhita, the Lord exists personally and impersonally within each and every atom of this created universe. The descent of the Lord from the spiritual world into the atom and into the universe indicates that without the presence of Krishna, the Supreme, personality of Godhead, nothing could actually exist. Now you notice that we chose the word the descent of the Lord into the atom. Appearing first as a seed, then manifesting the universe, the elements, and all the varieties thereof. I heard a joke about a scientist one time who challenged God. He said, God, we can do anything. Anything that you can do, we can do. We can create life, for instance. Uh, uh, I challenge you. I challenge you. you. You create life, and then we'll create life. Well, God says, okay. So he picks up some dirt, and presto, change becomes a man. The scientist, and then God says, your turn. So the scientist... Uh, uh, leans down and he starts to pick up some dirt and God says, wait a minute, not so fast. Get your own dirt. The scientists say that everything ascends. We say that everything starts from the top and goes down. The materialist, atheic scientists say that everything starts from the bottom, from water, from hydrogen and oxygen, and they combine from in, in the form of a vast ocean and then from that hydrogen or oxygen, some or other in an ascending process from those dull, inert chemicals, some or other they become conscious of them, they start organizing themselves, and at some point consciousness appears. A theory that kind of baffles common sense, to say the least. So the scientists, but even if you grant the scientists' hypothesis that everything evolved from chemicals. Where did the chemicals come from? Get your own, not so fast, God says. Get your own raw elements. Get your own chemicals. <laughs> and we all know the chemicals are not produced from an impersonal source. Chemicals always come from a person. For instance, if you exercise on a hot day, you produce chemicals. You produce sweat. And the sweat is what? Salty. So similarly, the ocean, the Garbhodak ocean at the bottom of this universe, um, that is salty in nature. It is the sweat of the supreme personality of God. That's where the chemicals come from. They come from the 
body of the creator, Lord Vishnu, who lies in the bottom of the universe and from whose navel comes the lotus flower on top of which appears Lord Brahma. So that gigantic Vishnu form who enters within each and every universe, he can produce immense quantities of chemicals to create a situation for chemical evolution. So-called scientists who claim to be able to duplicate or replicate anything job, God does, go into the laboratory and they get a few little chemicals that they purchased at a laboratory or at a wholesale place. But where did the vast number of chemicals come from that make up this material world? They came from the vast form of Mahavishnu, Garbha Dakshay Vishnu. The fact is that chemicals don't come about in and of themselves. A lemon tree, for instance, is a living being and it produces citric acid. The citric acid is, is not the cause of the lemon tree. The living being, the lemon tree, is the cause of the citric acid. Similarly, the chemicals are not the cause of life. Life is the cause of the chemicals. Just like the tree is the cause of the citric acid, the citric acid is not the cause of the tree. So, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Bijamam Sarvuta, the seed from which everything has come, is the cause of the tree that produces the citric acid. Therefore, God, the seed giving father, is everything. Sarvakal idam palam. Devotees, those who are trained by a bona fide spiritual master, Gyaninas Tadvadarshanaha, those who can see the truth, they understand that the original potencies causing the cosmic manifestation are not, as the atheistic blind, ignorant material scientists say, the cause of the cosmic creation are not chemicals, but the cause of the cosmic creation is the supreme personality of Godhead from whom the chemicals come. Now they'll also tell you that everything's coming from nature, that everything begins from nature, from material elements, from mother nature. And yet our experience of nature is that in and of itself, it's dull, it's inert. Nature is unconscious. I have a stack of books here. I have a desk. I have a bottle of Gatorade. None of this is conscious, nor at any point in future time <clears throat> will any of this become self-conscious. It is not possible. But this bottle is moving right now. The desk is supporting all the things I need to manage the temple. The computer is just dull, unconscious elements, and yet somewhere that's come alive with information through the internet and through various apps. How is that? It is because of the glance. It is because of the touch of the supreme living being, the personality of God. It's like iron. Iron has no volition, has no consciousness in and of itself. However, when you put iron into the fire, the iron becomes red hot and then it can act like a burning agent. Similarly, material nature in and of itself cannot independently produce life, can never become conscious of itself, can never organize itself from a lower form to a higher form of organization. However, when it is glanced upon, when it is empowered by the supreme cause, the personality of Godhead, then energy, material nature manifests itself in various varieties and tastes and diversities only because of the life giving, the animating glance of the Supreme Personality of God. And therefore, the permanent reality is not this cosmic manifestation. The source of consciousness, the source of growth, of life, of, of animation is not material nature, it is not the chemicals, but rather it is Krishna from whom this cosmic manifestation has come. He is everything. And yet at the same time, he is separate and apart, distinct and independent of this cosmic manifestation. Again, in the seventh canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Yatanaro Darishu Bina Ayate, Yatanaro Dehagata Pritapshita, Yatanaba Sarvagata Nasati Atapavam Sarvagata Shriapada. Beautiful examples given how the Lord pervades, supports everything, how the Lord is everything, and yet at the same time, he is separate and distinct. First example is Yatanaru Darishu. 
within wood there's fire. We don't see it, but fire is latent within wood. It, fire and wood are perceived to be as different, and yet fire is intrinsic part of the wood itself. And yet we don't see it. Fire and wood are uh, 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 wedded together, you might say, in material nature, and yet at the same time we don't perceive fire as being part of wood. Now another example is Yatanul Dehagata Pritak Shodam. Air. Air is situated within the mouth and the nostrils, and yet we perceive the air as being separate from the mouth and the, and the nostrils. Then Tatanava Sarvagatam Nasajate, sky. Sky pervades everything. Sky is not air. Sky is more subtle. Sky is called Akash in Sanskrit. So sky, when you run out of air, when your spaceship goes high enough in the stratosphere, it leaves air behind and enters into space. In space, there's no air. That's why you have to wear a suit and provide your own breathing apparatus and bring your own oxygen along with you. Otherwise, there's no breathable air in outer space. So, so space is pervading air, and yet at the same time, space is separate from air. So in the same way that fire, although it within wood, is separate from the wood, air, while circulating through the nostrils and the mouth, is separate from the nostrils and the mouth, and sky, while pervading and supporting air and such things as clouds, is separate and independent from the air. Similarly, the soul, the spiritual soul, the living entity, part and parcel of God, although within the material body, generates the body, and at the same time is separate and distinct from the body. In the third canto, we find the example, Fire is one, but it manifests itself separately. There's flame, there's sparks, and there's spoke. So according to this analogy, the fire is the supreme personality of Godhead, the sparks are the living beings, the smoke is this material creation, and then the flame is like the, the Brahman, the Brahma Jodi. So these are the three ways that from the original energy of fire, there are different manifestations and different varieties. But this is only due to the background presence of the fire. Similarly, material nature can act only when it is activated by the glance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Otherwise, the original fire, its flame, its sparks, and its smokes are all one. At the same time, the fire is different. The flame is different, the sparks are different, and the smokes is different. In every one of them, the flame, the sparks, and the smoke, the integrity of the fire is present and yet all of them are differently situated with different positions. They have different effects, and they do and they do different work in this material world. So similarly, the cosmic manifestation is compared to the smoke, because when the smoke passes over the sky, so many different forms appear, and they resemble many known and unknown manifestations. The sparks are compared to the jivas, the living beings, jiva muta mahabaho, who enter into all the various 8,400,000 no species of life and animate them. And then the flames are compared to material nature. The Prabhupada says in conclusion to this discussion today, one must know that each and every one of these is effective simply because of being empowered by the quality of the original fire. Therefore, all of them, material nature, the cosmic manifestation, and the living entities are but different energies of the Lord. Our conclusion today is this material nature, the chemicals from which the scientists say everything has come, have no separate and independent existence without the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. We have even more tomorrow to dish up for Transcendental Tuesday. But meanwhile, what is your feedback? Those of you who are on Facebook, you can write questions and comments there. And please do so while Rob is giving us his wrap-up here. 
Thank you, Prabhu Ji. Um, it just reminds me of, of like my two-year-old. He wants so much independence. He wants to do everything himself. He wants to be the source of all things, but he's not. And it's humorous to see. And I imagine Krishna probably sees us the same way. It's humorous for us to think that we're independent of him, that we can, that we're the source of things, that we create things, that things happen without his consent. Um, so we should, we should grow up and not be so adolescent in our thought processes and, and realize our dependence and to turn our will over freely. Excellent, excellent. How ludicrous we must seem from the point of view of the Lord. And yet he never gets fed up with us. He always gives us more rope. He always strings us along. He gives us ever more and more opportunities to intersect with someone who actually has knowledge. We're like blind men wandering around, bouncing off the walls. But in amongst us, he sends the bona fide spiritual master. Well, some people prefer to hold on to their blindness. They said, we've been bouncing off the walls for as long as we can remember. Our parents are bouncing off the walls. Our grandparents are bouncing off the wall. But we're just going to continue bouncing off the walls. It was good enough for our parents. It was good enough for our grandparents. And so it's good enough for us. But there will be fortunate souls amongst those blind people who will recognize from the words emanating from his mouth that here is someone who has penetrated the darkness, who has received transcendental divine knowledge from above, and can sort things out for us. And if we submissively and attentively hear and serve such a person, all the problems of life are solved. Thanks very much for that. So, Mahatma Dasi says we need a motivation every week. But you get it. You get Motivational Monday every week. Shukshma, Haribo, thanks for dropping in. Govinda cryptically says, hey, get your own diet. Get your own diet. Laugh out loud. I'll have to explain that a little bit more in the comment section. <laughs> that went past me. Shwati Saha, thank you for joining us. I think this may be a first time for Swati. So everyone say welcome, Hari Bol Swati. Let's see, study of the Department of Botany, University of Rajas, Raj, Rajhani, University of Rajhani. Thank you, Swati, for joining us. Bipin Shah, thank you. He's a member of the GCAU. I know Bipin. Bipin and Bharati. Bipin and Gora, thank you. Jay from London, Hare Krishna Jay, hope you had a great Christmas. Anjali, Haribo Anjali, it looks like we're not going to be able to bring over Jake and Sham for the festivals from England because they're not vaccinated, they're not willing to get vaccinated, and so you have to be vaccinated to get on a plane from UK to USA, so we're going to pass on that. But you know, Krishna has opportunities inside of these closed doors, and so I said to Anjali, I said, why don't Anjali's got a great singing voice and she's got a lot of on stage presence. So I suggest to her that she put together her own uh, set, half an hour, work with the DJ and they're there in Phoenix. I'll bring them out, see what they got. I remember our star performer, Malini, just with, had a background role in the old days, like 2013, 2014. We used to bring Vijay and the Kirtanias on stage. And uh, they would do the main talking and singing and hip hop and everything. And Malini was just sort of in the background doing interpretive dancing. Not a word would enter from her mouth and she would never take center stage. Well, Vijay is from England and he had visa problems. He had to leave the country, other, otherwise his visa was expired and he would be uh, overextended. And so at the time that the Kirtanias were no longer available, I told Malini, I said, Malini, you have so much potential, just put your own act together. And she she's now like the centerpiece of our festivals. When we had our Festival of Colors in September recently, um, one of the uh, festival attendees posted some videos of hers in the days after the event on Facebook. And the caption was, this lady has insane energy. So I like to take a little credit that we unleashed that, you know. Um, as an as a organizer of a, a multi-festival event, I'm always looking for raw talent and trying to uh, encourage them 
to develop their talent. I mean, if I can do hip hop, I know that anybody can do it. Anybody can do it. Why well, just speak of someone like Anjali, who has a great voice to start with? So we wish you all luck. You've got a few months left here, or maybe four months left. Not even four months. January, February, March. Three months, 90 days to put something together. But I believe you can do it. Luck to Gary. Thank you for joining us. Bye, Bobby. Still dressing the deities. Thomas, we're looking forward to him coming in a few days' time. Sundari Priya, Govinda Day, Brent. Let me go down back and see if there's any new comments. Oh, Jay is from, I don't know why I thought Jay was from London. He's from Phoenix, Arizona, same place as Anjali. Oh, and Govinda Dave explained, oh, okay, I couldn't understand his comments, he get your own diet, but he, he explained, he said he meant to say dirt, so that was the joke where God says to the scientists, hold on a second, get your own dirt, okay, all right, thank you for explaining that. Well, I had fun, and I hope you, I hope you had fun, and I hope it's informative. We'll be back with more of this good stuff. Tomorrow, on Transcendental Tuesday. In the meantime, have a great two days after Christmas, and don't forget to remember Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Rama.